So uh, then I will start. And um, good morning, everyone. This is Ole from Saiga Conservation Alliance. And today we are going to do something very new and exciting. Uh, this is the first time we are rolling out our uh, drawing masterclass. Uh, and the focus of this masterclass is our all time favorite antelope, the Saiga antelope. Um, and it's my big pleasure uh, to introduce you our special guest for today, Dr. Julius Chutani. Uh, Dr. Julius is a natural history illustrator and biologist. Um, having a PhD in natural history, he also does striking illustrations for books, museums, and uh, scientific organizations. So uh, he is a very inspiring artist, and I believe it's uh, fair to say that dinosaurs and prehistoric creatures are his specialty. Um, however, he also has got interest for a wider scope of wildlife, uh, and because of that, we are lucky to have him with us today. Uh, teaching all of us wildlife flowers how to create our own saiga antelope image. So on this note, let's welcome Dr. Julius uh, and I will give him a chance to introduce himself. Thank you very much, Olya. That's uh, some very kind words and I appreciate uh, you having me here on this uh, show in the first one of your drawing masterclasses. It's very exciting to be able to do that and um, I, I'm just very happy to be involved in some way, another way to promote conservation initiatives. So uh, this is great. And yeah. Um, yeah. So exciting. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your creativity. My pleasure. And it's always nice to see um, these kinds of things uh, being done to help increase awareness about wildlife that need help. Um, so yeah, so my name is Julius Chitany and I am a biologist by training and uh, right now a scientific illustrator and natural history artist. Um, and I use, uh, what I do to make a living basically is uh, work with scientists and museums and book publishers um, and various other organizations to uh, visualize uh, wildlife and all sorts of natural history subjects. And um, I'm going to show you a few slides of some of the kinds of things that I do just as a little introduction um, uh, to give you an idea of um, what it is uh, visually that I do. I'm going to just um, share my screen for this and give you an idea. Sounds exciting. Mm. Uh, for how long have you been doing all this? I've been doing this, um, I mean, I've, I've, um, I started as a, a hobby um, back when I was, uh, for as long as I remember, but I've been doing this um, commercially uh, for, uh, since about 2005. Oh, wow. So it's, it's been, it's been a little while, uh, but, uh, here we are. But yeah, it's, um, it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, and I just have so many different kinds of adventures that, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, artwork and illustration that I've had with this, this whole project and so on. So, so yeah, that's, um, this is an example of something I've done. I've done a lot more work nowadays with uh, conservation and promoting knowledge about wildlife that needs help. And so this is an example. Was, uh, as I said, I was trained as a biologist, so I work um, as a microbiologist. Uh, I have a PhD in microbiology, uh, studying things like deep ocean hydrothermal vents, which are uh, sort of volcanic areas on the ocean floor with really unusual and interesting life forms. I studied the bacteria there. Um, I also studied um, uh, mosses uh, and how they grow and how elk trampling uh, affects the growth in, in uh, Canada as well as some very interesting uh, mutualist interactions between plants and uh, the pollinators, uh, yuccas wow. and yucca moths. So lots of different fun things. Um, now I illustrate images for scientists a lot of the time. I work closely with scientists to help promote um, the familiarity of the public with their work by producing press release images and figures for papers. Um, so then that gets into uh, journal articles or news stories, sometimes the covers of our journal articles. Um, these are examples of some of the pieces I've done that have gone in uh, as, uh, as press release images that are released the same day the publication is. And so that helps the public to become sort of visually aware of what's happening there with these. I also work with uh, museums to produce sometimes nearly life-size murals of uh, prehistoric wildlife or, or modern wildlife. Mostly it's prehistoric wildlife, I think it's, as you said, that is sort of my specialty. That's what I'm more known for. Um, and so some of it is nearly life-size. Other ones 
This one is at last year's opening of the new exhibit at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. So this was a very large piece that was um, sort of enlarged to the size. Um, wow. Uh, and then I also do a lot of um, uh, illustrations of books. And one of my favorites um, to do is, is illustrations for children's books because um, I find it so important to reach out to children and to be able to help them to become interested in science and uh, the natural world because they're going to be tomorrow's uh, policymakers and scientists and responsible citizens, the people who are going to be looking out for the planet and for the biosphere um, after, uh, after our generation. So it's super important for us to be able to make contact with them. And this is why I love doing these kind of drawing sessions too. I've done different kinds of books for children from arthropods, prehistoric life, as well as sharks. Uh, there's a new one coming out uh, this year on whales and dolphins and porpoises. So every species basically is in there. Wow. Um, and uh, stamps as well. So this is an unusual kind of uh, thing. Um, st stamp sets either for kind of the post or for the United yeah. States Postal Service. Um, and my wife and I both illustrate for the uh, Royal Canadian Mint as well. So we've designed a bunch of coins. Um, and so we collaborate on some of these projects as well. And so, and then uh, in addition, and, and um, you can point out afterwards as well, I've done some uh, color issues for the Saiga uh, conservation as well. And they do for many other species of animals and plants as well. And so um, this kind of is a, I think a fun interactive way to interest uh, children and adults in, um, you know, conservation of animals that need uh, uh, a lot of attention. Um, this is an example of some of the, the uh, conservation-based paintings that I've done showing Bahita, the most endangered um, species of cetacean. Um, this is another way that I, I, I use my skills. So I'll, I'll, I'll do live painting in, in acrylics um, to do fundraising where the painting is done in one night and then sold off, auctioned off to raise funds for whatever initiative. I've done this for various organizations and it's one very concrete way to help to raise money for the, uh, the, the purpose as well. So there's examples for Sierra Club and so on as well. And so that's a good example of some of the, the ways in which I use artwork to um, uh, hopefully help to raise some awareness uh, about conservation issues and um, get people involved and, and it's a lot of fun I think. Oh wow. So Thanks with that question. I guess um, how about we start and uh, start drawing some Saiga. Um, so what's actually the best way to, to pronounce it? I've heard it pronounced different ways. How, is it Saiga or Saiga? How do you pronounce it? It's Saiga, yes. Saiga, okay. So it is Saiga. Right. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So just wanted to get that uh, accurate. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm going to, so the, the best way to do this is if you're at home uh, watching this, uh, you can do this um, most easily by just taking a sheet of paper um, and, and then if you have more than one color or uh, darkness or weight of, of, of pencil or pen or, or, or colored uh, uh, drawing implement, then it's best to have two of them if you can. Um, so what I'm going to do is draw using sort of guide shapes first to help us to establish the size and shape of different parts of the animal. And then after we've done those guide shapes in sort of lighter color or lighter weight, um, I'm gonna switch over to do the final details. And that one will be with a heavier weight or a dark color or pen and ink, or whichever you prefer. Um, that would be the easiest way to do this. And so the way I'm going to set it up is I'm doing it on a, uh, a graphic tablet. Uh, and so this will be directly drawn onto um, the, uh, uh, the digital file on the computer. But you can easily do this with uh, regular pen and paper. I've set up the paper to be A4 size um, equivalent, uh, but I guess it really doesn't much matter as long as we sort of pay attention to approximately what part of the paper we're on, and uh, that should help. So I'm going to start um, by sharing my screen. Uh, in the application I'm using here. And that way, you can start to see. Okay, so you should be able to see that now. Yes. And, uh, this is now the page that we're working on. I'm gonna just try this. Make sure we have the right, but here we go. Okay, so I've maximized that now. And if um, 
Oh, if, if you can see if there's anything that's not visible or, 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 or needs to be uh, enlarged and so on from your perspective, just let me know. Sure, absolutely. Awesome. So let's, let's start. Uh, so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to start with uh, a Saiga portrait, like that wonderful little creature there uh, standing behind Roya there. Um, and uh, these are some of my favorite bovids or antelopes. Uh, they are just wonderfully wonky looking. Just They look so beautifully goofy with their nose. Um, that snout is just amazing. And um, we're going to do this by introducing also some interesting information about this animal. Um, both I and Olya will be talking about them. Uh, and there's so many interesting facts to learn about this animal and, 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 and things that, that, that scientists have um, uncovered about them. Uh, such a fascinating uh, species of animal. So I'm going to select here now my um, two colors. So to make this easy to tell apart, I'm going to do the guide shapes in red and then the details in black. And then these were going to be on two separate layers. And so it'll be pretty easy for me to be able to turn off one or the other. And hopefully we'll be able to be easier to see the difference between the two as well when, uh, when you're able to um, uh, look at this on, on the screen. So first of all, I'm going to go here and start, go into the proper layer here. And we're going to select um, a, a pen, I guess. There you go. Okay, so this is what it'll look like. Okay, and that's, that's going to be the first uh, color. And then when I switch into the final details, I'll put those ones in black. Um, for now, we're just going to stay with red. And, um, oops, computer behaves properly. Okay, good. All right, so. Uh, this is kind of the layout of the screen here. Um, this is sort of an A4 size. So what we want to start with is um, making a, a an oval shape, kind of like an egg. And we will start in the sort of the lower uh, right-hand third of the page, and it'll look like this. It's a little bit of a the smoothest egg <laughs> it can be. It's okay. It's fine if it's like that. Um, okay. So these are going to be, this doesn't look much like a saga antelope yet, but that's okay. It's going to develop. That's normal like this, I suppose. Uh, the next thing we're going to do, and we want to pay attention to the relative size and position of these different shapes, because these will help us to, to guide the overall um, shape of the animal. That first one is kind of going to be the main part of the head. This next one is going to be representing the snout of the animal. And again, it doesn't look much like it yet. But you see where I put this oval shape or egg shape is going to help us to kind of determine where the snout should be. Okay. And so first of all, we'll put a few of these shapes in. It makes it easier to see uh, the overall shape that we're looking at. This is going to next represent kind of the the animal's uh, orbits or like the areas in the skull where the eyes are. Uh, one of the neat things about the saiga and a lot of these these um, herbivores or uh, plant-eating animals that live on on wide open plains is they have these really big um, big eyes and 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 well set out from the skull. So they kind of bulge outward and then they have this, this kind of stereo vision where they can see almost every direction around them, which is very important because predators um, can sneak up on them from any direction and they have to be, while they're eating, to be aware of these, right? Um, and so here now we're going to put the, the guide shape for its near side eye. We're going to look at this animal mostly from the side here, just to give you an idea. And it's pointing to the left, so it'll become obvious as we draw it, but just to give you an idea of which way things are pointed. So that's going to be representing the eye within the orbit, because the orbit is that, and, and it's really nice that you have that, the picture of the saiga behind you there, Oya. You can actually see the way that that works, so these massive uh, sort of bulging eye um, areas that, that house the eyes that, that allow them to see all around us. It's really neat. Now, within the eye here, within this circle, 
um, we're going to put this line here that represents kind of the eyelid of the animal. Flagons have this, um, and kind of like goats as well, to which they are related in, in, in some way. Um, they have these, these eyes that, that kind of wrap around a little bit. And um, these eyelids kind of, in the middle, they kind of droop down a little bit. Uh, and they have these, these pupils that allow them to see such wide areas around them. That's kind of the eyelid um, there. Now, um, we're going to put in the opposite side uh, orbit. Now, the reason is because this animal is, is mostly from the side. So it's kind of like a little bit of view, sort of a little bit, little bit pointed toward us, but mostly from the side. So we're still gonna be able to see but the bulge of, of where the eye would be on the other side of the animal. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to make this kind of potato shape um, as well on that side. Like this. Actually, it doesn't even have to go any further than that inward. So I'm just going to make a little dotted line here. It doesn't matter. Um, really, what's important is that outside edge. We put first. Okay. Um, now the, the snout. Uh, it, I, this is this is the, the most wonderful part of this animal, I think, is and it so sets it apart from other types of of antelopes. Is this amazing snout? So this is the tip of the snout. I'm going to put it here, and it's represented by a small egg shape, looks like that. And it's it's an it's such a it looks like a vacuum cleaner head in some ways. I guess you could say it's got these really big nostrils, and and it ends in this. This sort of flat area that almost has like a folding forward, like book-like uh, shape, and 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 it, it ends this enormously enlarged snout, um, huge um, nasal cavity. Uh, we're going to connect though that that little egg that we just drew to the the the, the big snout egg uh, with this line here, it's that from the top of that little egg to there, basically. Okay. So that kind of helps to connect the tip of the snout where the nostrils are, which is that small egg, to the bigger uh, enlarged nasal area. Uh, and also, I'm going to take the back end of that head circle, the very first one that we drew, or the head oval, and we're going to give it a little bit of a corner at the bottom. So you go to the bottom of that back here and make a little bit of a corner like that. That's going to represent the jawline, the back of the jaw. So these animals um, don't have as rounded as it showed initially uh, on, on their jaw, but it has a little bit of a corner there. So that helps to define the shape that we're working on. Now, uh, the nostrils. So this, this is one of the neat things on this animal here is that it's got really big nostrils compared to other types of uh, antelopes, its relatives. Uh, so what you do is you go to the front of this snout, this smaller egg shape that we drew, and we're going to draw two little, how do you call these shapes? It looks like this. Not quite ovals, like half ovals, I guess, almost. One there, and one next to it right here, like that. And these look very different from, like other animals have some of these sort of uh, almost flat-fronted uh, nostril areas as well, like some like pigs do, but they look very different from that. Um, the, these have, the, these are much more open, much larger nostrils than those of, of pigs and other animals that have sort of flat fronted noses as well. And um, well, yeah, can you tell us something about why, wh what is the reason for this, this unusual <laughs> large snout and nostrils? Yeah, this, uh, so this is probably one of the coolest feature of the saiga. Um, and there are, a few reasons for that. So, uh, first of all, it's just a biological adaptation uh, given the climate situation where uh, the saigas live. So, uh, basically, they live in extreme temperatures um, and during the summer it gets very hot and the area is very deserted. So, for this uh, period of time, they need nose to filter the air. Uh, and many people assume that they have uh, a fantastic uh, sense of smell, but it's not unfortunately quite true uh, because they basically use the nose to filter the air. Uh, however, in winter time, the temperatures are extremely low and um, the adaptation changes a bit. And so in this case, they use their nose as a heater, uh, which is another cool thing that uh, these animals can adapt to such uh, different uh, surroundings and situations where they live. Um, but another cool thing about this nose is that uh, during the mating time, 
uh, it also becomes larger uh, and so that the animal, the male in this case, uh, looks even more representative, uh, representative and big. So lots of fun things going on with the snows. That is really interesting stuff. And it, it, it's so, so fantastic to, to, to see how animals um, have evolved to specific environments that, 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 you know, they have these characteristics that help them to survive better. And it's just so obvious sometimes visually. It's not always the case. Sometimes we, you know, there are certain types of enzymes or other types of physiological traits they have that maybe we can't easily see. But this is a really wonderful example of a very visual trait that's very obvious. And it's interesting to see that, how it's also used during the mating season for the males to be able to compete with each other visually as well. That's, that's so interesting to see that in animals. Um, really cool. Yeah. Really. I guess and their mouth is just underneath all of that. And so that, that's what I'm going to put in next here. Um, and so you have this kind of a little, at the bottom of that big snout oval, we're just going to put kind of a little mouth, this very slight curve in it, you can curve in either direction a little bit, but it looks kind of funny now. It, it looks like a balloon animal, the way it's put together like this. And, and I guess, you know, if we were to leave it with guide shapes, yeah, it would very much be sort of a balloon animal. Um, but it's going to be more interesting than that, hopefully. Uh, the, the next thing that I want to do, and, and while you were talking, I, I zoomed in a little bit here as well, so that we have a little bit more, a better view of it. May as well make use of the screen better if we can. But, you know, keep in mind, it's only a portion of the, of the uh, page. Uh, but here we're going to put in the, the neck uh, guidelines. And so one of them is going to come from the bottom of the, the throat here. Start and just a little curved line coming down like that. And then one uh, connecting sort of the top of the head, neck here, little curved line. And then because there are these big muscles in the neck, and actually if you look at your own neck, you can see that there are these large muscles that, that um, come off the side of your neck. And there's these grooves that, that um, uh, show up where at, at the edge of those muscles. And that's kind of what we have here is this, you can make a kind of a, a, a thin or a dotted line here is kind of a, showing the bit of a groove that outlines one of these sort of large muscle groups in the neck. So that kind of helps to put the head on top of the body of the animal, basically by the neck. So the next thing we're going to do is um, go back. I'm going to zoom out a little bit because we're going to do the horns. And the horns are another really neat feature of this, these animals. Um, beautiful horns, and I guess especially in the, the Russian saiga, right? Because the Russian saiga has the larger horns of the two, I believe. The, the Mongolian saiga has smaller ones, but... Yeah, so um, basically, yeah, there are two subspecies of saigas, uh, and the one found in Russia is also common in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, whereas a subspecies in Mongolia is uh, a little bit different from the other one. Uh, and that's true, they, they have uh, some visual differences. So, for example, the horns, and you're correct in that, uh, they may look bigger. However, it also depends on the age of the animal. So the older the animal gets, uh, the longer the horns uh, become eventually. So they don't lose their horns um, like some of the other species. Um, and it just stays there uh, with them throughout the entire life. That's really neat. And they're really beautiful horns too. These um, very uh, these nice ribs that, that um, form along them. Uh, they just make them look so impressive, actually. And I, I imagine they, they must be pretty sharp looking at it too, so it's probably <laughs> best to, to be careful if, if, if you're around them. So what I'm going to do to draw these horns is kind of a, a different way. This is to make it a little bit easier to draw two horns that are side by side on an animal that we're looking at, not from the front, not exactly from the side, but sort of in between. Uh, and so it looked kind of funny at first, but bear in mind, just bear with me and, and it'll become obvious why we're doing it this way. So we're going to start at the, the orbit that's on the opposite side of the head and go up and watch this weird shape that we're going to make. Comes up and then curves like this and then curves back. So imagine kind of like a really weird tall hairdo. <laughs> sort of um, kind of a slightly forward tipped uh, at the top. And the reason we're doing it this way is because now we have the outline for both horns in one stroke. And the next thing that we're going to do is put in the inner edge of each horn. Now, it's not connected. The, 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 horns, uh, the two horns are not connected, so we're going to be able to sort of erase out or, 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 or make less visible afterwards that connection. But this will help to put both horns in. So one horn, we're going to finish the inner side like this. It's very narrow at the tip. 
and then it comes and widens out toward the eye, like that. So that's one of the horns. That's the one near us. And then the other horn, uh, we're going to start again at near the top, but not quite where the other one started, but there's a gap between them. And it goes like this, just like that one. Gets a little thicker as you go toward the bottom. And then, so they, they don't meet at the bottom, but the way that the animal is turned, one of them is sort of in front of the other a little bit. And so that's why it looks like they meet at the bottom. But as you can see, really nicely, again, the picture behind Olya there, it shows an animal facing us, and you can see how the horns are separated at the, at the bottom. They don't actually meet. But we have a different angle here. Okay, so that's, that's the, um, the overall horn shapes. Uh, now we can add some of those, those really nice ribs that are on the horns that give them this ornamented look. So the, it's really simple. We're just going to put um, several lines crossing the horn. And they have a very particular kind of a shape. Um, now, th these lines, kind of slightly S-shaped, a um, little curve, and each of these actually, each of these lines will mark, the say, the top of one of these thicker ribs. The ribs are actually quite thick, um, so I'll show you in a second how that works, but we're just going to put a few of these lines in, crossing the horn, and then you can see how it kind of changes in the angle as we go toward the top. Um, it's, it's a very specific kind of a way that they are. And, and, when you, and it changes depending on the angle that you look at it from. And then on the other horn, and you'll see that on the other horn, these shapes, slightly different curvature looking because we're looking at that from the inside outward. Like rather, like from the or the, the inner side of the horn or the animal's center. So um, the, the curvature is sort of complex. It goes up and down and up and down around the horn. Uh, and then you get these kinds of uh, interesting curves. Now, each of these ribs, uh, each of these lines represents something that's a little bit thicker. So really, if we were to draw in the whole rib, and which we can add that afterwards, um, I'll take this one here as an example. It'd be more like this in thickness. This kind of would just kind of show you the bottom edge of it. That's kind of how each of these ribs are, right? So they're quite, quite thick. Um, just for now, because these are the guide shapes, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, the other thing to remember is that on top here, this connector here, um, when we're finished, you can actually remove that. You can erase that out afterward and just there to indicate that. But for now, I'm just going to move on to the next stage, which is the ear. So I guess have these, actually they're relatively short little ears um, compared to some other antelopes. You see some antelopes with really big ears. These guys have quite short ears. Um, Olya, can you tell us about why that might be that they have pretty short ears? Um, the thing is, uh, their ears don't have um, such a huge importance when it comes to uh, adaptation mechanisms that, that, that they have in order to survive. So for them, it would be more uh, other features like the speed uh, and their nose. That's why they don't uh, emphasize the use of their uh, ears, like in terms of evolution. Uh, and that's why they don't, like they didn't have the reason to develop them very strongly. Um, but if we go back to the horns, for example, that are very close. Uh, so the horns actually have uh, some more interesting features. And uh, this is more to uh, point out that uh, there is a difference between, between males and females. So if uh, we talk about the horns, only males have them and not the females. Um, and also uh, horns, unfortunately, is the reason why the saga populations are declining these days. Uh, and that is because saga horns are harvested for uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and sometimes they can be used also as a symbol of uh, status uh, in some of the communities. So uh, this is unfortunately right now the reason that brought sagas to extinction to the brink of extinction, not the total extinction, of course. Yeah, that's very concerning. And, and that's actually a good point. Um, thank you for bringing that up because that was something that goes really well with the, the horn. So that's, that's frightening. And um, I didn't know initially, actually, until recently that, that the horns were hunted so much uh, of this species. And, and I know that's the case for a lot of different animals with horns. And it's really sad to see that something like that happens with, with Saiga as well. And um, these are, 
these these are are, are very sort of um, uh, kind of deeply cultural, but not not scientifically supported uh, reasons for them to be using the horns either. And and so this is something that is important for us to, to keep in mind is that this is another reason why it's, it's unnecessary for them to be hunted this way, right? For the horns, it's not even not even based in in, in, in very good reason for it. And 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 it's unfortunate that that's happening. And this is why it's so nice to be able to have um, outreach that that helps to reach people to to encourage them to seek different ways uh, rather than, than hunting them. Yeah, that's for sure. And, and a lot of it comes from uh, some cultural backgrounds and traditions. And uh, many of those things are quite outdated these days and we have so many other substitutes. So just recognizing that is also very helpful um, so that we can move on with uh, new traditions. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense to me. Um, so there you go. And that's uh, that's the horns and then the ears as well as as Olya was saying that their hearing is not particularly as as used as as for example sight um, um, Right on these guys and then um, the other thing is um, if I'm not mistaken these guys actually live in a, Compared to other areas. They have a, a pretty cold environment for a lot of the year compared to a lot of other antelopes and one of the things that we see in in um, animals that live in cold environments is that their limbs and their ears and such become relatively small and shortened. Um, as this is an evolutionary advantage to cold because the, the larger something is, the more it, it radiates heat, in, especially in warm-blooded animals. And so if it's smaller, it helps them to conserve heat. They also have pretty short legs, I guess, right? Relatively speaking to something compared to like a giraffe. <laughs> so um, another sort of good example, pretty narrow legs though, I guess though too, but the, the ears are pretty and squat. So that's kind of like, I've got the two ears now is just kind of little sort of lemon shapes almost <laughs> sort of on the sides. Um, and then the last thing that we want to add to this here is to these guide shapes is, is certain features on the face that help to define it. And so one of the things is that um, these animals have, so uh, first of all, there's, there's a, actually a little, little guide down here by underneath the nose. Just a little bit of a connector line between the tip of that nose and then the, the area near the mouth there. Like that. Um, the snout has often these kinds of like almost like accordion ridges <laughs> kind <laughs> of um, and, and are these uh, and I'll, as I draw them in I, I'm gonna ask you are these kind of used to is how mobile is that that snout that enlarged snout and 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 what are, are, are these these lines that you see on some of them sometimes like this, um, are they areas where they can kind of move the snout a little like contract it or how does that work? Yeah, so it's quite movable actually and uh, if you look it up uh, you can see some pretty funny images of the saiga when they try to turn their, their head and then you know it, totally the head is there but the snout is somewhere else. So <laughs> <laughs> it looks uh, quite amusing but yes it's actually quite soft uh, and very movable and so um, it's kind of like um, those fringes that you find uh, on the snout is basically um, just, just the type of material let's say and so it's not uh, it's not like a hard muscle so it's not um, contracted like in a very strong way and that's why you can see this very uh, typical shape for the saiga. Oh that's neat. That's interesting. It's uh, and it makes them look even more wonderfully goofy when they when they <laughs> move their snout in various ways. It's, 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 funny. Yeah. it's almost like the trunk of an elephant isn't it in some ways. Um, it's, it's or like um, like a tapir um, and you see that in their skulls too uh, how it's similar in that sense. There's this really big really big hole in the top of the skull just like you would have on some of those animals with very um, uh, mobile and, and large snouts like on tapers and elephants. Um, very interesting to see that when you look at the skull as well and you guys like see that and you say, like, aha, that's got to be a snake. <laughs> and you can repeat them. It's really interesting. <laughs> so we have here a few and there's a, uh, there's a few little wrinkles sometimes in front of the ear that you see. Um, there's a little bit of a, a groove here that you often see under the the nose going up to the snout and again this is that enlarged sort of nasal area um, that is is being sort of separated out by by a visible groove uh, and then there's also a little bit of a sometimes you see a little bit of a groove under the, the mouth like under the mouth area like that and then there's one other thing here is this um now i 
I think you'll have to help me with what this is called. In front of the eye, there's this little dark area. Um, yeah, go on. Right. Uh, I, to be honest, I don't even know how to call it in English, but yes, it's, um, it's just some typical coloring um, scheme that they have. So it's just part of their... Um, and, and sagas change color uh, throughout the year. So for example, in summer and in winter, they are quite different. So in summer, they would be more like beige color, uh, something that you see on my background. Uh, whereas in winter, they turn white and become more fluffy. And so um, their, this, those like darker uh, patterns under their eyes uh, change also depending on the season. And uh, you can especially see them um, during the mating time. Because uh, again, in males, uh, it becomes darker and more visible. Oh, interesting. Okay, so it's almost like a like a gland, like sort of a thing, isn't it? And almost like a lacrimal gland, gland or something. Yeah. I, I I should know this. I don't remember exactly what it is. I just remember visually that this this happens. Um, okay, yeah, very interesting. And so, oh, by the way, we should say too, right, that this one that we're drawing here is is a summer coat of an animal. So it's it's got a uh, smaller amount of fur and imagine its coloration and I guess you guys can all color it too after you finish. This is one of the fun things about this kind of drawing so you can color it in. Um, but this one based on how the shape is and, and the, the length of the fur is is more typical of the summer coat of the animal. Yeah so. that's that's very true because the proportions would also change if you try to draw a winter coat for example. It will be more like bigger, fluffy, bulkier. They, they look really special when they have the full fur. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's great. So oh, yeah. what I'm going to do is switch the colors now um, to do sort of the, the outline, the, to put the, the details in place. We've used our guide shapes here, and now it's just really going to be easy to do this sort of final um, details on this one uh, so that it looks less like a bunch of ovals and more like a continuous line for the animals. So all we have to do really for that is um, a switch to black in my case. And um, you can actually even, like I said, you can erase out some of these parts, like for example, that, that space between the horns. Um, and if you want to, you can, you can lightly erase some of the lines that we've put in place, but it might be better to hold on to them for now until we put in these sort of details. And it's really easy. We'll start at the tip of the snout um, like this, and I'm just going to make sure I'm the right layer and then just kind of follow along the, the outside of this line, but not the inner parts. And then up here, uh, we'll follow up the forehead, which is this part here, up toward the horn. And I'll stop there. And then I'll, I'll continue by starting at that orbit, uh, that bony area that holds the eye on the other side of the head. Like this, come up toward the horn, and kind of just you know, put a little dotted line across the horn like that. Same place we have the, the ear sticking out, so I'll just kind of outline that exactly the same shape as I set up. And uh, for the horn, now for the horn, imagine these lines that we drew across it, those cross pieces, those ribs. As I mentioned, they're all pretty thick actually, each one of them. So when we're going to draw the outline of the horn, just keep that in mind, and we're going to add a little bit of a bump to this outline each time that we have one of these cross pieces um, to show that. So here is what's going to happen. I'm going to go up and then a little bump here, up again, a little bump, up, bump, and keep going like this all the way up the horn, well, for the lower part. And then as you get toward higher and higher on the horn, those, whoops, those bumps become smaller because the ribs become less distinct and toward the top they actually vanish entirely and you have just this wonderful curvature in that horn and it's a complex curvature too it curves forward and backward and inside and outward um, and when we start coming back down the other side we start to add little bumps at the top where each of those cross pieces is and then as we go down these bumps become a little bit larger toward the bottom of the horn, they're a good size, like the ones we have on the other side of the horn. Like that. These guide shapes help us to know where to put those bumps, so like that. And then I do exactly the same thing with the other horn, starting at the bottom, in the front side, bump each time we come across one of these cross pieces. So again, that just kind of shows us that 
there is a, a ring, a raised ring around the horn at that point. And, and it makes them look very attractive. Antelopes and, and their relatives have the most beautiful range of different kinds of horns. Such a wide diversity among different types of antelopes. And oops, I made a little mistake there. I have to do a quick little erase. <laughs> and coming down the other side and they'll start with small bumps at the top. Each time we come across one of these crust pieces and they grow a little bit as we go down. You don't have to do it in one continuous line like I'm doing right here. Um, it can be done or you can sketch it as you go. It doesn't matter, whatever works best. And then we get to the bottom like that. And now we have the outline of the horns. And this is a, a very interestingly complex kind of horns these guys have. Then at the bottom of that horn, you can actually add a little bit of like little dotted lines or little lines of kind of fur where the, the horn and the, the fur meet basically. Now behind the horn, we'll continue the, the head down toward the ear and then I'll stop at the ear and I'll start at the base of the ear and just outline it just like it was set up with the guide shape. That sort of weird little lemon shape or clam shape. I don't know what you, you would call this kind of a shape. It's, um, it's a weird one. And then we have those edges here that show us where the ear is sort of open forward. And then that, those two lines in the center there basically just show us where the, 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 the fur, the long furs in the ear meet toward the center and then um, you can actually color that center in like this. And if you wanted to show those furs, because these are quite long furs um, on the sort of the front inside of the ear, you can just make little lines like this. They're kind of facing inward. And you can see this, if you have like a dog or a cat, for example, you can look at their ears and you see similar kinds of patterns happening there. Okay, so that's the ear on our side. Um, you can even add these little bit of wrinkles here next to the ear since we're near it. Then I'll continue with the neck, the top of the neck going backward, just like the line we set up before. And now I'm going to have to actually just move this up a little bit so that I can see the bottom. There we go. Uh, the next thing is I'm going to continue again from the front and go backward from the nose. And so the nose, now we can just finish up that, that round front part of the nose where it's sort of flat and add those nostrils in the same way. There's a huge nostrils. And you can actually fill them out with black if you like, because just to show that they're darker inside or just hatched lines, sort of like little lines next to each other even to make it sort of a half tone or color them in with gray or whatever, or dark gray, you know, whichever makes them look dark. They're, they're gaps basically, or they're holes. Uh, then we have these, these little accordion lines a little bit. These vary in how visible they are on the, on the snout, right? Um, and then the little groove under the nose itself. Then I'll go down from the base of that round part of the nose down toward the mouth and then draw the mouth in like this. Um, they actually sometimes have a little bit of a, a lip visible too, so you can add a little bit if you want. Mm -hmm. And then underneath the chin, the chin comes backward. <laughs> it's funny, they almost remind me of sharks in some ways, the way that their mouth is underslung or or starts a little bit back of the nose underneath the, the head. So in that sense, wow. they're, right, they're, they're more like, like sharks in the way their mouth is set up than most antelopes are. <laughs> <laughs> Who would know? <laughs> yeah, it's something where I, I just draw so many sharks, especially on these kinds of drawing sessions that um, right. I'm more aware of certain visible kind of <laughs> relations, I guess. <laughs> it's brilliant that you pointed out. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> oh, and now to connect the, the, the base of the chin here to the rest of the, of the, of the head here, just, you know, this is not going to have to be as too sharp a uh, connect corner here. So we'll just kind of make it a little bit smoother and continue toward the back here. And then, in, and then go out to the back of that, that jawline that we drew is that corner. And then just kind of 
just end it with a little bit of a dotted line because there's not a very sharp line at the back of the, of the head as it connects to the neck, uh, unless they're turning their head toward you, in which case you get a bit of a fold there, right, as we get with many animals. Uh, the throat continues down from here and just exactly the same line as you drew before. And again, that little dotted line to show the groove where the muscles of the neck um, show up like that. Then the last things to add here are the eyes. Now, the way that we've set up the orbit on this animal, you don't have to draw the whole um, oval there, basically. But rather, uh, there is kind of a... A bit, it, it's visible on top, so there's a bit of a line here, like on the orbit on the other side, and then it kind of, kind of, kind of peters out a little bit. It kind of stops a little bit, and then there, there's again a bit of a shadow, often visible on the the underside of the orbit, um, especially because they bulge out, and that shadow makes them look more visible. And then the eye, we're gonna we're gonna draw the from the eyelid first here. So I'm gonna. Take that line that we set up for the eyelid and just follow that along, bit of a curve, and then go to the bottom of the eye from there. Same way we drew that. Now for the top of the eye, the upper part of the eyelid, I'm not going to make that into one continuous line, but I'm going to make it sort of a little bit of a dashed line because it's it's not really heavily set off. It's it's basically a fold. And then that little dark sort of gland or whatever that, that coloration is in front of the eye, you can just kind of also um, draw that according to the same way that we had it in the guide shape. It almost looks like a teardrop. <laughs> um, and if you want, you can fill in the eye. It's, it's very dark uh, in general. Um, and uh, what I like to do in eyes when they're shiny like this is you put a little bit of a reflective um, dot in the center, not in the center, but rather sort of where the sun's uh, um, image would be reflected. So often near the top of the eye, and if you imagine that the light is coming from the front, then we can just put that, that reflected point of light from the sun maybe in the front top. I'll make a little circle here, and then I'll fill in the rest of the eye with black. The eye, the actual, um, the visible part of the shiny part of the eye is just that lower part of this circle. We'll leave the eyelid separate and, and clear for now. There you go. Um, so now, oh, actually, one other thing we can add is there's, there, their snout is really neat because we're, we're looking at it from the side here mostly, but the, the one behind you, Olya, there is, is, is nicely shown from the front. You can see that groove down the center of the, of the snout there. And so we can actually represent that a little bit on this image too by a little dotted line near the top edge of the snout here near the top edge because we're seeing it mostly from the side but it's still visible from this angle okay so now if we were to actually remove oh well actually sorry one last thing is that i didn't put those those cross pieces in, uh, on the horns in the, the final so i'm just going to put a few of these, these cross pieces in in, in the, the dark color maybe underneath them even a little bit to where the bottom of those bulges start that's the last thing that we need for this portrait. After that, you can go and, and mostly erase out the guide shapes that we put in underneath uh, this dark color because those ones are no longer going to be necessary. Uh, and so you can either lightly erase them out, being careful not to erase the final shapes that you made, the final lines, or um, you can leave them in. That's fine too but it helps if you're able to remove them a little bit, or this is why we made these, these, these final lines darker so that they're more visible. Now, I have the ability to actually, because this is digital, I can reduce the, the brightness or, or the, the, the darkness of those, those guidelines. And when I do that, this is what happens. Um, and we have what looks much more like a saiga antelope uh, in its sort of the final drawing stage, and, and that's what you should basically have once you remove mostly those lines. That's the portrait of the animal. Um, we were talking about, however, uh, how they have different kind of a coat in winter and summer. And uh, one of the things that is neat to be able to show is the um, animal's whole body, which looks in some ways a little bit like a goat, um, but also when you see the animal in its winter coat, 
you can see how much of a difference it makes, that thick fur, especially in the neck and head area compared to the rest of the body. They actually look really interesting that way when, when, when you see the whole animal in its winter coat. And so what I'd like to do is do also a quick drawing on the side here, since we've got a lot of paper space left here, of the animal sort of just standing in its whole, um, the whole animal, uh, the, the whole body of the animal, basically. Correctly. <laughs> and um, so to do that, we're going to get another um, a bit to do here. And this should be fun. I am going to just turn on the layer here. Okay, good. I'm going to uh, go to the whole animal here. And we're going to just, this is going to be quicker. Um, but now that we have some idea about what the head looks like, we want to see how it looks like when the whole animal is put together. And uh, so here we go. So I'm going to switch back to, again, your light color. Um, in my case, it's going to be the red colored sort of ink or digital ink, I guess. And we're going to go to the other side of this page. So right, we put the, the portrait here. Or if you have filled up your page, you can always grab another page and maybe make a new image of it. Uh, the main thing is keep in mind where on the page we're drawing this. And so we're going to start with kind of a potato shape on the left side. Yes. The first piece that we're going to draw with this is going to represent the animal's uh, abdomen or the area around the, the stomach and the, uh, the, the guts and so on. So the, the, big, the big belly of the animal, basically. So yeah, it's a big rounded part. Uh, and they have a really nice bulky body, right? Um, and, um, uh, well, yeah, how do they, um, how is it that they, um, do they have, uh, I guess, like fermentation happening inside, like with, um, with other types of, um, of, of ruminant animals, I guess, where they, when they, and they would have then these, these symbiotic bacteria in them, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's must be. So they have large, large, um, uh, stomach, uh, chambers. Um, to house these these special kinds of, of bacteria that help them to digest the cellulose in the, in the plants that they eat. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to gain a lot of um, nutrients from them. And so this is why a lot of these antelopes and other uh, um, herbivorous or plant-eating uh, hoofed animals have these large, bulky bodies uh, because they have to have a lot of space. So yeah. that's going to be the abdomen. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I also wanted to add that uh, interesting fact that uh, cygnus usually, when they give birth, they give birth to a few animals, uh, two at a time, for the most part, sometimes three. And only during the first year uh, of pregnancy, they might give birth to one antelope. And so again, like they, they need uh, to have at least three males to have some capacity to be able to uh, bring up at least two um, little cygnus inside, and they would be able to give birth every year. So. Um, that's that's, uh, right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's that not the work, but that, that's well, they why they're really, so resilient. That's actually a good point too, right? Exactly. You need space for for to be able to have uh, two babies at a time, um, and um, they're um, they remain pregnant for was it seven months? months? Seven, seven months. months. Seven months. Yes. Wow. So that's impressive, actually. So they have to hold on to babies for a good long period of time for them to grow inside them, um, and then. Uh, and, and so this is actually really nice. And this is actually a good point too, right? Because they reproduce so quickly, potentially. That's very important, especially when they under, when they have, like for example, in 2015, right? There was that very massive die off. And so they lost so many numbers. Um, and, and they're recovering from that now? Uh, yes, they're recovering from it right now. Uh, in fact, the number of Saigas uh, came back to what it was uh, before the die off. Uh, the die-off has been quite massive, and we lost 65% of the global population of the Saiga, uh, which is a lot, uh, especially if you imagine that it all happened uh, in a very short period of time. So we're talk talking about a uh, few weeks, really. Um, and so because, again, they, they have this adaptability uh, to give birth to a few cows at a time, uh, it allowed this animal to be quite resilient and bounce back uh, at large numbers. 
Well, that's actually really nice to hear it. Uh, it it's, it's, it's really great to hear stories where, where, where a, a species that is so endangered, critically endangered in this case, is able to bounce back from certain events like that so well. So that's a good reason why they're, they're able to use uh, their highly, um, their, their impressive ability to reproduce to do that. So I'm going to add now the next part here is the, the shoulder area. It's kind of another little oval shape coming in the front here. Like that. So that's going to be where the, the shoulders are basically. The neck uh, is going to be kind of another oval and it overlaps with the other ones as well. So you don't actually have to draw in the full oval if you don't want. Um, it just makes it easier to visualize, but so it kind of go like this. I just draw in the back of it dotted. It's the, really the front part that's important because it's the neck. Now the head here, similar to what we did before, but this one um, I'm going to make in kind of like a, a upside down teardrop shape sort of, or a teardrop shape on its side. The reason is because that part in the front there is going to be the big bulging snout. And then underneath here is where the mouth would be sort of underslung. And then the jawline back here. And we'll see afterwards how that works. There's going to be a bit of it that we're going to pull out. Um, the horns again, now we're seeing it from a little different angle. Now we're seeing the animal more from the side than the one that we drew before. So these horns are going to look closer together. And so we're going to do exactly the same thing as we did with the other one in drawing both horns at once using this funny kind of bent shape to show that the way that the horns are, are twisted. That's both horns together in one shot. And now we're going to separate them by adding the the inner part of, or the front part of the horn that's near us, like that. And then the inner part of the horn that's on the other side of the animal, like this. I find the drawing of them together like this helps to keep them in the right position with respect to each other though. Okay, so the next part is the legs. The legs are actually um, not very large, so there's going to be one front leg here. It's, think of like a table leg in this case, <laughs> sort of as an analogy. Um, the, the, the hind legs have these powerful muscles on the, the upper parts of the thighs, um, which is important for them because they can run really, really fast, right? Yes. Uh, in fact, they can run as fast as a car. So it can be uh, as fast as uh, 70 miles per hour or 110 kilometers per hour. Amazing. That is amazing. So, I mean, that that's, you know, goes to show that how, how these, these legs aren't extremely long, but they can really propel them very fast. <laughs> yeah, well, they have to run away from the predators and their predators are wolves. And for obvious reasons, you, you better run fast. <laughs> no doubt. And that's actually a, a, amazed me uh, and as we do this, I'm adding the back parts of the, the leg here. You can just kind of follow along. But what's amazing is how fast they can run. They're, they're similar speed as, as pronghorn um, in North America or in many of the gazelles of Africa. Um, and those ones uh, evolved in response to predators like cheetahs that can actually um, go to those speeds. Uh, for example, in, in parts of North America, there used to be a cheetah species. Um, uh, that, that evolved there. And some of the ideas are that the pronghorn maybe uh, are able to run as fast as they do at similar speeds because of the pressure from these North American cheetahs. Um, but um, it's interesting that, that the saiga have also uh, evolved to, to be able to run at this incredibly high speed. So yeah, I'm adding that. Uh, in fact, there were evidences that uh, we also used to have cheetahs in Central Asia. Ah, okay, so there you go. Yeah. That's interesting. So <laughs> that actually makes sense then too. And so this is neat when you look at animals and you see some things that like makes you wonder, why is it that it's like that? Sometimes what we're seeing is we're missing parts of the picture today and that there were at some points in the past interesting uh, elements of their environment that, that are the reason why they are the way they are today. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm adding bits of the, the legs. There's the, the front hoof and the hooves are cloven. They have two, like two toes basically on them that are visible um, that hit the ground. And there's other toes um, that are little knobs left over. Um, that, that's the little knob that we're seeing on the front foot there. There's also a, 
a little bit of a, a line that comes up here from the back of the, the animal's elbow, which the elbow is way up on, near the top, near the animal's um, torso. And then on the back foot here, again, you can see the, the hooves and it's, it's cloven or, or split um, to two toes. And then there's that little knob in the back, which is another toe. Okay, and then it also has a tail, right? And so these guys have a little bushy sort of tail here. And the reason why we have some of the, you'll, you'll see that the, 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 the proportions of this animal are such because it's, it's, it's a winter coat as well. So especially around the neck and the head, you can see that it's gonna be thicker. Um, I'm just gonna add in the ear as well. Now we've done ear on the porches, it's gonna be similar, but it's a little thicker because again, we have more fur, it's winter coat. That's the ear on our side. Uh, and then there's that little opening between the, the furs that are coming inward. So you see it like that. Okay. The eye, um, I'm just gonna start with the eye itself and not the orbit this time. And it, it starts right here. It's a little kind of a lemony shape like that in front of the ear. And it looks kind of funny now, but that's because we haven't added yet the, um, the uh, part of the, the front of the forehead. But the orbit around it, again, you have these this lines that kind of come around it like this. That's the big bony part that, that um, the eye is inside. And then there's that upper part of the eyelid as well above the, the actual shiny part of the eye. The mouth, again, and here you see it's it's very clearly it's it's underneath and behind the tip of the snout. Um, it just just really looks interesting that way. Now we're going to add that line at the front of the forehead that helps to define the shape of the the, the bulging uh, muzzle. And uh, there's a bit of a, a bit of fur in the front, kind of like my my hair sticking out a little bit here. Uh, and so it comes out from the front of the horns. There's a bit of a bulge here with a bit of fur and then down and then comes out forward like this. So when you're finished, you're actually gonna remove this line a little bit here, a little line through it when we put the detail on there. And so this is gonna show that little bit of a bulge of fur in the front of the... Now, the uh, animal's back connects those, those, um, those ovals that we did. So starting at the top of the back, we're gonna make this line that kind of connects these a little bit to show that the back of the animal and the top of the neck to smooth it a little bit. Like that. And then there's uh, large muscles in the front of the legs where they connect with the chest um, that uh, help it to move its legs as it's running as well. And so we're just gonna add a bit of a bulge down here. These are pectoral muscles. And so they help the legs to move uh, forward and inward, to propel the animal along. Uh, we also have some legs on the other side, of course. Uh, we can add these. I think that um, just to save on time right now, we're going to go with these, uh, the legs on our side and leave those at that. And, and then we know that there's another pair of legs behind it, but we're looking at it from the side. So one pair of legs is behind the other. And I'm just going to skip that just to make sure that we're well in time still. And um, the last thing that we need for the guide shape here is a few facial details, such as, again, those funny little creases on the snout um, that are still visible, the, those cross bars or the, 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 the pieces on the horns, the ribs on the horns, those little ridges, that. I imagine there's a, a set number of these and maybe they increase as the animal grows, as you said, the horns grow in size, or I'm not sure how that works, but that must be yeah, I guess you're right. It makes sense. Um, I can say for sure with the horns, uh, but also with the coat. I, I think it's quite likely. Interesting. Interesting. No, it's neat, neat animals are so neat. So this is it. We have now the guide shapes. The one thing that we want to do now is to add to draw those lines together, like we did with the previous portrait. And now I'm going to switch to black and you can switch to either a darker color or a heavier line or a different kind of um, implement, like maybe a pen. 
and this way we'll be able to tell these lines apart from the previous ones more easily. So I'm going to start up here at the horn, um, and then the nearer horn again, it's a little bit of bumpiness again because remember all that those ribs try to put little bumps in your cross lines are. And the top, the horns kind of, they kind of point inward a little bit, they point a little bit toward each other at the tip. And more bumps along the edge here. This is the horn that's nearest to us, and so it's in front of the other horn, even more so than in the other drawing that we did. Because now it's from a more side view, and that's why they kind of overlap each other. So I'm just doing the other horn now, and the tip kind of points inward, sharp little tip, and it kind of comes down again. And as we go toward the bottom, those ribs become larger on the horn. Like that. You can add again a little bit of a uh, little squiggly line where the fur meets the bottom of the horn. Yeah. And now we're going to move forward on the forehead of the animal. And so there is this little bunch of fur here that comes down and then it continues along the top of that snout, that really enlarged nasal area. Now you see this, the nose is not, the nostrils are not visible here. The reason that I drew it like this in this case is to show again, how flexible and movable that, that nose is. And so some of the time they can actually be pointing downward like this. And so when they're pointing downward from this angle, you wouldn't actually see those open nostrils like we saw on the portrait that we drew. So here you just kind of draw a slightly curved line like that. And the, you see there's that little bit of a crease, this little dotted line up here again to show that there's a large sort of chamber of the nasal cavity. It's separate from the, the area where the mouth is. The mouth comes up again like this. And then the chin, not much of a chin there. And then the jawline comes back. And we can kind of stop at the, the back of the jaw. And then you don't have to draw all the way up toward the ear because it's a bit of a smoother connection there. The eye, we'll just do it exactly like we set up the guidelines lemon kind of a shape and then there's the eyelid which again is sort of a dotted line and again you can make sort of a not too heavy line or a dotted line for the that that bulge of the, the orbit uh, that bulgy part of the skull where that houses the eye the ear will outline the ear just like we did before with the guide shapes and again remember there's that sort of the area where the fur the long fur meets toward the center of the ear can fill out. Now here's the part where we go to the neck and this shows again how thick the animal's fur is. So we're going to connect the head with the neck and there's a bit of a smoother connection here. And at the bottom of the neck, at the throat, you can actually make that a little bit, the line not too smooth, a little bit more squiggly, just to show that there's a long fur that, you know, it's not terribly clumped, but it's a, a little bit not completely smooth because you can see a little bit of that furriness. And it connects up with the chest here, those big pectoral muscles. That's the bottom of the, of the neck. Then at the top, we're going to go to the behind the horns and, and continue backward and kind of smooth it along this line that we drew that smooth those circles all, all the way along the back of the animal. And actually here at the very back where the thighs begin, you can kind of draw it a little, very slight bit of a corner turning downward, not completely smooth, uh, not completely round. And continue it with the tail. Tail just continues from here and goes down. It's a little bit of a bushy tail like that. Very much like a goat's tail, I guess, in many ways. We used to have goats. When I was uh, growing up, we raised goats on our acreage in the in rural, rural area. And so we had, um, I, I, I got to see a lot of goats. And so these guys um, remind me of goats in some ways. Yeah, they should. Really they, they have the same height as goats, pretty much, and very similar structure, so. Oh, and, and it's really adorable, the, the, the babies. Um, and I'm just going to continue the leg here. Meanwhile, the babies, how um, I was reading in the material that sent that um, they, and, and um, also some additional references that they 
once they're born, they, they hunker down in the grass and they go flat and, and to hide from predators. And, and it's just so neat to see that. They look adorable just laying there. <laughs> yes, they look absolutely adorable. And then it is harder for predators to spot them just because uh, their color perfectly matches the background. Uh, and another cool thing about the babies is that they are actually able to run already after two days wow. since they're born. And they're able to run very fast, um, faster wow. than uh, human babies for sure. That's impressive. It just goes to show how wonderfully they are adapted to such a life as sort of this nomadic species of, um, of antelope that moves around a lot. And they migrate, right? Large distances. Yeah, uh, definitely very large distances. And in fact, they're migratory species. So uh, going from place to pl place is their lifestyle. Uh, and they do it because of the climate situation, because of the weather, um, in order to find better pastures uh, or in order to give birth. That's interesting too. And so that, that's really neat how um, some animals can actually respond to changes in their environment, not by hibernating as some of them do, but to moving around to different places that have better conditions for them. Exactly. So many different ways uh, how to survive differences in climate. There we go. I'm just putting in the last line here at the back of the, the back leg. Uh, and now we have, and I actually put in a few little lines here, little dotted lines along the neck, near the back of the neck, near the front of the body, to show a little bit the separation of the neck from the body. Um, I think we've got pretty much everything we need on our animal here. Uh, we can fill in the eye, because right? that's also dark. And if you want to add a little bit of a light spot to show the reflective nature of the eye, that's doable. Oh, and I forgot to put in a few of those little accordion kind of little grooves on the snout, just if I reduce the brightness of or darkness of the guidelines like we had on the other one. Okay, I think that's it. Now, if I were to uh, reduce the, the darkness of those guidelines, or if you want to erase out partly some of the, the guide shapes that we drew, this is what's going to happen. So I'm going to reduce that darkness. And presto, it changes into a drawing of a saiga. In winter coat, you can see here the neck is thicker relative to the other drawing that we did. Um, it, it looks less skinny, it looks fatter, thicker, bushier. Um, and this is what happens, right, in winter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it looks amazing. And um, it's so interesting how you can put simple lines together, like simple shapes. and. All of a sudden, you have the saga, even two sagas. <laughs> and that's it, exactly. And, and this is actually very much like, I mean, it, it's, it's useful to do this as a, as a teaching tool, but also keep in mind that as an artist, as professional artists, we kind of do this in our minds all the time anyways, that when you see something that we want to draw, um, we, we tend to break it down mentally into simpler shapes to try to, and, and fit those together and try to really comprehend only those simple shapes at a time, um, a few of them at a time, to make it easier for us to see how uh, a complex animal uh, fits together. Um, and so that really helps in, in, in real time uh, when we're doing this as well. Yeah, and because at first you look at it and it looks scary because you don't know where <laughs> to start, but... <laughs> Exactly. exactly. But you made it, it so down. simple. <laughs> well, this is good. Well, there you go. So that, that's, that's our Saiga. Uh, and you can, now you have pictures that you can color as well. You can sign it. Um, uh, and then you guys are going to um, encourage people to, to uh, show their images as well, right? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I almost finished my painting. So oh, I, I will ask for your opinion in this case. Okay. There we go. Oh, excellent. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Uh-huh. And there we go. Oh, that is amazing. That's great. That so, looks really, really good. Perfect. Such a good explanation. And excellent. like I said, everything was super simple. So I think, yes, uh, it's a fantastic masterclass. I think oh, so many of us, like our communities will find it very useful. And, and I enjoyed learning things. Yeah, and now that we also have uh, coloring sheets, it's fantastic because we can make different colors and we can just make um, more like graphical drawings. So thank you so much for that, really.
Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun. Um, it's been a lot of fun here. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think that we're, we're probably nearing the, the, the maximum time of the uh, session. So I, I'm guessing that you probably want to wrap that up before it cuts us off automatically, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we still have a bit of time, but um, do you mind okay. if we do a little Q&A session? Yes, absolutely. I'd love to. So um, we reached out to some to our communities and we got a few questions. So um, some of them are related to Saigus, but some of them are related to your uh, profession. So um, to start with, uh, please tell me why. What, what do you like about the Saiga? What's so special oh, well, about this for you? I mean, I one of the things I love animals and and plants and um, life forms in general because of their diversity. They're, but I especially like the really unusual looking. And so something that stands out that 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 is different from the average and saigas are so unusual because of their snout they're just they're just fascinating looking that way and i you know i love animals that have really unusual kinds of forms like elephants and so on their trunks are spectacular looking uh the way they're able to manipulate objects with those and saigas are kind of look a little bit like elephant uh, versions of antelopes and so they're kind of neat that way so i i love their snouts i think that that's my favorite part of them uh, i have to agree on this one yes that's for sure um and also could you tell us uh a little bit about where you come from and if there are some kind of endangered animals in your region well that's a good question actually um so i was born in hungary um but i live in canada and um, uh, I am actually less familiar with the, with the wildlife of, of Hungary in that sense. I think this is something where I have a lot of learning to do. But in Canada, we do have actually um, quite a few endangered species here as well. Um, and I live on the west coast of Canada in Vancouver. Uh, here in the west coast, we have rainforests. And some of these ones are very much in danger of, of still being logged, some of the old growth forests. And many species of animals and plants require this old forest to survive well. Uh, there are, for example, there are um, uh, spotted owls. Uh, these are species that, that hunt uh, flying squirrels and um, they live in, in, in areas where they need this large old trees, um, these in complex environments uh, to survive well. And they are very sensitive to disturbance of the environment, for example. There are many different kinds of species around here that are also endangered. We have Vancouver Island uh, marmots, which are also very much endangered. There are very few of them and um, they live on the island um, uh, near us here. Um, and so every part of the world you go, you can usually find quite a lot of species that are facing threats to their survival in some areas more than others. Uh, the Sega is a good example of that. Yeah, wow, and it shows such a diversity because in every corner, like you say, you can find so many species, some of which are endangered, uh, others are not, but it's just amazing what the diversity we have. Oh, absolutely. Um, and some of the, especially the richer areas like rainforests or coral reefs would have an exceptionally high richness or diversity of animals. Some of those have the highest proportion or, or largest numbers of endangered species that you find there as well. Exactly. So, yeah. And it's so different from what, us in Central Asia because we, like, we pay, it's like where we see such a different uh, setup, such a different environmental system. So it's very exciting. Um, yeah. And if we speak about the saga again, so if you try to remember the first time you saw an image of the saga, so what was the first thought that came, or like what was the first impression when you saw this weird animal? Wow, <laughs> that is so odd looking. They look really cute. Um, <laughs> I think I saw one from the side more, uh, and, and, and you know, the way that it snow just bulged like that, like, wow, this is such an unusual animal. Um, <laughs> everything else, it looks like you know, a normal, acceptable, regular kind of an antelope that you'd see in other places, but that snout is just so amazing. And uh, so that, that's really what's, what, what stood out for me. Uh, seeing the babies crouching down under the grass is also adorable. They look very much like pronghorn that way. Pronghorn do a similar thing in North America yep. um, to hide from predators. Uh, but, uh, but these aren't, they, they've converged um, evolutionarily on a similar kind of a strategy. Uh, they're yeah. relatively unrelated to each other. It's just interesting to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, also, what made you decide to draw a Saiga? Well, that was actually fun because um, I've been networking with different uh, people and organizations that um, do conservation work to help protect animals and plants. And I heard about the, um, uh, this wildlife expo, the Spring Wildlife uh, Conservation Expo. expo. Um, uh, 
uh, the Wildlife Conservation Network. And I attended that, and that's how I saw what you were presenting on the site, actually, on a presentation there, and learned about um, these conservation initiatives uh, with the uh, Saiga Conservation Alliance. And when I saw that, I thought, hey, this is this is one more species that, that would be fun to be able to work with this way and to be able to, you know, introduce a bit of a, a drawing session, for example. I've been trying to find different groups to do this with, and, and I've had wonderful success. Um, and, and this is one more way to help raise awareness about the, um, this, the conservation that they need. And so it was nice to be able to connect with you folks and to be able to do this. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, and uh, I remember the first time we met online uh, through WCN. So that was uh, very exciting because you offer such a non-standard way how to help the environment by doing some art. And um, speaking of which, so um, can you and and you touched base on it a little bit in the beginning, but um, can you tell me what kind of ways do you see like how artists or illustrators can, could actually help save the environment and endangered species? Good question, actually, because this is this is something that I think is is important for people to realize that people love to see pictures, right? I mean, they're popular. Whenever you look at n news stories, the pictures stand out a lot, and so we can use as artists, we can use our artwork to portray uh, animals and plants and other species that are in need of protection to help to make it visually uh, obvious to people which ones, especially, are going to be in, in greatest need. Um, pictures can help inspire people. Um, beautiful paintings can can really raise emotional, um, uh, raise a lot of emotions in us. Um, uh, they elicit a lot of an emotional response, and they can uh, often sort of elicit kind of a more care, uh, concern for for the subjects that way as well. And so that's a very powerful kind of a tool, uh, a powerful way in which you can use artwork um, for this kind of. Um, purpose. Also, as I mentioned in, in my intros, uh, one of the things that I do is uh, fundraising paintings, where I'll do a painting and then it's auctioned off and the funds from it are used to support a conservation um, project, for example. That's another way. Um, or work with um, scientists who are doing conservation work to help put together packages for education that are then sent out to schools um, all over the world or in certain regions. Um, or these coloring sheets that I do to help to engage children to have fun while learning, for example. There's many, many different ways that we can use artwork to help to bring to awareness uh, many different species uh, uh, threats to these species or to help to mitigate the problems by helping to raise funds directly or to, um, to increase concern for them. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful that you said it because I think uh, so many people don't have an opportunity to think outside of the box when it comes to art and many other expressive ways um, to represent something. So um, if we talk about your work, so what uh, kind of message uh, do you try to communicate through your art uh, and whether it changes depending on the audience that you, you're working with? A good point. Um, I think for me, uh, I, I would describe myself as a, um, uh, a, a stubborn optimist, basically. <laughs> um, I, I know that there are many problems facing wildlife in many parts of the world today, but I will not give up on hope and, and working toward and actually helping, hoping to encourage people to, to cooperate and come together and, and work towards solving these problems, because we can. We really can. This, this last pandemic has shown us how much we can change, how rapidly we can change major systems very quickly in response to things. We can do this. And what I'd like to use my artwork to, to do is to show people not only the species that are in danger, but also to try to encourage them somehow to act, to make a difference, because we certainly can. Uh, we always have to remember how important our individual actions are when they're collectively done. They are very powerful. We've managed to make huge changes just by working together, even when we're apart. Yeah, I cannot agree more. That's true. And, we, and especially with this pandemic, it showed us that essentially we are all in it together. So. And there are so many different ways how we can support each other, that's for sure. Um, and I guess uh, my last question would be more practical. So for someone uh, who is watching us right now, 
uh, who is trying to draw a sag or any other species. So what would be your top three practical tips at how to get better at drawing wildlife? Oh, that, that, that's a really interesting and fun question to try to answer. I mean, there are so many different things to do, but there's a couple of things that stand out. Uh, one of them is um, trying to draw from life if you can. I mean, photographs are great, but if you have the opportunity to see wildlife safely, <laughs> because you don't want to approach certain wildlife too close, especially you know, because they need their space, <laughs> uh, need to respect them. And also some types can be dangerous. Um, they're, not all wildlife is, is safe to approach. So that's best to be careful. But if you can see wildlife or to go to a, a zoo, a well-run zoo or, or other places where you can see living animals, it helps to be able to um, to see animals alive, to draw them rather than just in photographs, because you get to see them from different angles. Um, and, uh, or even if you can, you can still get a different um, impression of them when they're alive. And so if you can see them out in the wild, that, that would be nice. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, as I was saying, and, and the reason, again, why I, I, I set up the drawing session this way with the guide shapes first, is try to break down uh, mentally the, the animal into a series of small shapes that fit together, rather than trying to you know, draw the whole thing at once. Um, it really helps to try to see, you know, ears as triangles or the body as a cylinder or maybe the head is composed of a series of circles or whatever works for you. That really helps. Um, and as I said, professional artists do this all the time in their head to try to do this to, 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 to comprehend, especially new shapes that we haven't drawn before. So these are good to do. The other thing is do a lot of reading in the scientific literature. Um, there are some beautiful information out there. And um, don't rely on, on just drawings that others have made. Look at the original scientific material. Uh, and this is especially important for somebody like me who does reconstructions of prehistoric landscapes that we can't see anymore. I have to entirely rely on the uh, work of scientists who, you know, clean, who find the bones, remains, you know, prepare them, uh, and then, and then find ways that they fit together or, or, or find ways to interpret uh, the various impressions in the rock of soft tissue and stuff. So I have to work closely with them to be able to interpret this and to represent it visually. And similarly with living animals, um, don't look at just photographs, look at video, L talk to scientists as much as you can. They're happy to share information generally uh, and, and become involved in, in, in uh, groups and this is a good example here with the Saiga Conservation Alliance uh, to be involved in conservation groups that also help to spread information about these animals, to learn about their life histories, how they behave, not just the way they look at any given time, but it's interesting to draw pictures of animals doing interesting things and things that they really do in the wild. And so, you know, when you're describing, for example, the herds of hundreds of thousands of animals moving at once, uh, it, it's, it makes for, you know, it inspires, um, you to think of new ways to draw these, for example. And I like to, to, to try to think of, of, um, of ways to draw animals that aren't maybe always the, the same ways everybody else has done them. Uh, come up with new things, be creative that way. So these are a few of the tips that can be helpful. Um, and above all, don't be discouraged if it doesn't work out well at first. Your first drawings won't be what you necessarily expect um, if you've just begun drawing, but just be patient, have fun with it. That's the main thing. Don't give up. Just it takes a lot of work. Uh, that's expected, but have fun. Fantastic tips, Julius. Thank you so much, and I'm very glad that you brought up the point uh, about reading the scientific literature because you have a very complex background, and surely it gives you so many advantages. So. Uh, I think taking advantage of different areas uh, in life and different fields is something that can help you become better in ours as well. So thank you so much for joining us for this masterclass. It was fantastic. Uh, so what we're going to do, we are going to put up the materials, uh, meaning the coloring sheets uh, and some information about Julius uh, in the description. And so you can find more information and uh, get all the links. Uh, but Thank you so much again for making this happen. It was a lot of fun and I cannot wait uh, to share it with it everyone. <laughs> yeah, it was my pleasure. It was, it was great fun. And uh, yeah, it was, it was fun to talk about so I guess. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah, I hope people enjoy this and, uh, and we'd love to see your pictures.
<laughs> we we should post them on online. So it would Definitely. be interesting to have this <laughs> composition of different a gallery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like That's a good. virtual gallery. Yes. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Very nice. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Olya, and um, uh, thank you very much, Carlin. And it's been a pleasure to be uh, here and be able to to do this. Hey. <laughs> I think I'll I'll stop recording then is that mm -hmm. Sounds good